So the eight subconditions are somewhat difficult to work with. Now, luckily, most of the time, uh, we actually don't have to deal with the form of these conditions that we saw in the previous video. Uh, for many problems that are, are relevant to us as computational engineers, they actually show up in a slightly modified version that is a little bit easier to handle. And this is the, uh, the, the, the these are then called the Ledizhenskaya uh, Babushka Bretzi conditions the, or LBB conditions. Uh, so most of the time, if we if we run into problems for which coercivity does not apply, uh, we'll be dealing with the LBB conditions instead. And these LBB conditions are applicable, again, for, for special problems that are not entirely of uh, this general form, the one we had here, the one that we dealt with in the previous video, but if the problem is of a slightly different nature. And that's going to be a problem of the following form. Find a solution pair, U and P, and, and clearly I'm already uh, kind of moving towards the Stokes problem because the Stokes problem is a very clear example of, 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 exam of, uh, of problems of this form. In, now yeah, let's stay with X and Y, so X and Y. such that, and then our bilinear form kind of decouples in this form, and the, the u doesn't even have to be a vector field, right? So it's just a combination of two, uh, two uh, solution fields, u and p. And let me call this bilinear form. Let me not use the capital B, but let me use uh, A. Uh, plus b times p comma v equal to, and I'll, I'll still stick with uh, l for the right hand side, and b q comma u is equal to zero. So this might seem like a, an awfully specific uh, problem formulation, but it's actually some, uh, a formulation that uh, occurs quite a bit. Uh, these are called saddle points, saddle point problems. And in one of the future videos, uh, we'll see actually why these are called saddle point problems. It doesn't matter too much for now. Now we're just focusing on, on the analysis of these kinds of problems. Uh, but these saddle point problems, they originate from constraint minimization problems. Uh, minimization problems are, are something that we're quite familiar with in computational mechanics. Uh, for example, the minimization of, of a strain energy in linear elasticity. And if we then try to do that um, under a certain constraint, uh, then we always obtain problems of this form. And for problems of this, problems of this form, coercivity does not hold. And again, we can show that by the same example as we did for the Stokes equation, because the Stokes equation is a special case of, of this equation, of this formulation. If we choose u to be zero, then, then we, we get a coercivity constant of zero, irrespective of, of our solution p. As that means that coercivity does not hold. So we would typically have to look then into the in subconditions However, for problems of this form, the subconditions actually uh, simplify a little bit. It's difficult to really call this a simplification, but in a sense, it really is a simplification. And then they become this, these LBB conditions. So what I'll try to do in this video is um, I'll give you the LBB conditions and I'll try to, uh, to explain why the subconditions change into those conditions uh, for these kinds of problems. So for problems of that form, the LBB conditions are the sufficient conditions 
for well poseness. And I'm writing now sufficient and not uh, sufficient and necessary. Um, there's different ways of writing these LBB conditions. Some are slightly tighter than others. Uh, and, and you can actually write them in a form that they are sufficient and necessary. But for now, I'll, I'll write them in a slightly sim simpler form. And then they're just sufficient and not necessary. But they're also uh, the, the, the forms that we'll actually uh, uh, be able to use uh, for other problems that we will, we will deal with. So the if subconditions for problems of this nature become the LBB conditions and these look like this. We have again two. We have the condition, we have a condition on the bilinear form A and we have a condition on the bilinear form B. And the condition on the bilinear form A is that it is co uh, coercive. for all functions v in the space v in x such that b q v is equal to zero for all v uh, for all q So this is a coercivity requirement on A. Coercivity is something that we, we have worked with before, that we're relatively familiar with. It is something that we, we, can, uh, we can work with, we, we can prove. We've proven this for a couple of, of cases, and it's, it's not, uh, not, not too difficult to prove. Now, the, of course, the trick here is that it doesn't need to be coercive for all functions v in, in our, our space x here, but it needs to be um, coercive for all the functions v in x under a certain condition. So that means that it has to be coercive for fewer functions, actually. And that, that makes the, the condition uh, uh, less tight than a typical uh, coercivity condition. Uh, again, A needs to be coercive, but not for all functions v in, uh, in x, but uh, all functions v in x such that this, uh, this, this, this condition is true. And for the Stokes equation, for instance, and this condition is saying that the divergence of u, q is going to be equal to zero for all q in L2. So this is essentially a, a divergence-free solution field. Yeah? So then it would essentially say that the bilinear form A is coercive for all functions that are divergence-free. And that's then something that we would have to prove. Okay, so that's the first condition. This is a type of coercivity condition, so that's what we're, we're, what we're happy with. The second condition is still an inf subcondition, but it's not a, a too bad of an inf subcondition. It is namely only an inf subcondition on part of our system of equations, and namely the, the B part. So B is inf substable in the following sense, that the infimum of Q in Y of the supremum of V in X of B, Q, V Right, so this was our also the coercivity or the, the inf subcondition that we had before. So why is this now easier to handle than the original inf subconditions, even though we still have an inf subcondition? Uh, well, first of all, the other inf subcondition was actually kind of uh, annoying, to be honest. This one, so that's uh, that's one that we we no longer have to work with. We don't have to worry about this one anymore. Um, then we have separated our original problem into different bilinear forms and then each one of these bilinear forms uh, we have a specific condition now that's typically easier to prove than having to prove something for a, a very large bilinear form yeah so in that sense uh, this is a simplification or a simpler set of properties to prove than the original in subconditions 
Now, I still want to give you an idea of, of why these conditions now uh, become the relevant conditions. Um, I think this is maybe not a, a very uh, easy line of argumentation, so, so I won't ask you to, uh, to do a homework assignment on this, and I probably also won't, uh, won't address this in the oral exam. Uh, but nevertheless, I feel like it's important that you at least have some idea of where these conditions come from. The thing that I do find very important and that, that probably will be something I will ask you in the oral exam is uh, what the difference is between the LBB conditions and the inf sub conditions and when do uh, the LBB conditions apply. Right? That, that's, that's, I think, something that uh, uh, you should uh, know after you take this course. Okay, so let's try and understand why the original M sub conditions now suddenly became these two conditions. So, why do why do we have these two conditions? Okay, so what we're going to do is we're first going to try and prove that U is well defined, the solution U is well defined given this condition. And once we've been able to find the solution U, I'm going to move this guy to the right hand side and then I'm going to try and solve this equation now for P. So firstly again, I'll try to prove that if these conditions hold, then we can obtain a solution U. And actually the only condition that I need is the first condition. And the second condition will be the condition that will give me P. So first, Prove that condition one is sufficient to define a unique solution U. Second, second, given this solution U, condition 2 is sufficient to define a unique solution P. That's going to be our, our setup. Okay, so let's start with the first step. We'll use condition number one is coercive on this special space and to prove that you that there exists a unique solution U. So let's take a look at this uh, this set of, of conditions. So at first, I don't know if a, a, a set of uh, solutions U and P exist. I do know that if a solution U does exist, it will satisfy this equation. So that means that the solution U actually lies not only in the space X, but it lies in the space X subjected to this condition. If it exists, it will not only be a function in X, but it will also be a function in X such that this condition is true. And so let me actually write these as... Uh, uh, so then I'll, I'll refer to these equations. Those are equation... Uh, indices or whatever. So our line of arguments will be given the second equation if a solution U exists it will be in the space X zero. 
And X0 is defined as the space of functions v in x such that b uh, q v is equal to 0 for all q in y. Yeah, so if I somehow get a solution from this, uh, from this set of equations, well, then naturally use a function in x because that's why I'm looking for that solution. And if it exists and this equation holds so that it not only lives in x, but it also lives in x such that this condition holds. Yeah, so it's sort of a subspace. It's a subspace of x. And x, actually, that's also going to be the, that is the same subspace as the one that we're dealing with here, right? So it's, of course, not by accident. Okay, that means, or then, equation, the first equation becomes, becomes, find u, p, in v0, or, sorry, why am I writing v, in x0 times y, such that, a u comma p uh, plus b p comma v is equal to uh, some linear form of v for all the uh, for all v in x. So now I want to look for a square problem. What I'm going to do is I'm not going to consider all test functions v and x. Now, only consider v in x zero, which is a subspace of x. So I'm not yet, I'm not yet going to consider all, all test functions. I'll only consider a set of test functions. If I only consider this set of test functions, what does that mean? Uh, by definition of that space x0, all functions in this space satisfy b, q, v is equal to 0, which means that if I now rewrite my problem, find u in x0 such that a u comma v plus b p comma v is equal to l v for all v in x0, then actually this term is by definition equal to 0. So that drops out of my equation. Yeah, All functions in, in this x0 space are such that, that the bilinear form, or uh, sorry, this part of the bilinear form is equal to 0. Uh, hence, this one is, 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 uh, is kicked out of the equations. Yeah, so, so I really get simply find u in x naught such that a u comma v is equal to l v for all v in x zero. So that's a very simple equation. That is an equation with only one uh, one unknown field. Uh, it has the same space on both sides. Uh, and actually for this equation, we know that coercivity is all that we need. And that is precisely the first definition or the first requirement. A is coercive on this restricted space. Yeah, and now we actually gave this uh, space a name. This is now x0. So if A is coercive on x0, uh, then this gives a unique solution. Since A is coercive on x0, we have a unique uh, solution u. Okay, good. So now we have a unique solution u, but I only considered a subset of my test functions, right? Only the test functions in x0, not all function, not all test functions in x. So that means that this equation by itself, where is it? This one is not completely hold, uh, does not completely hold yet. We've only proven this uh, for a subset of, of test functions v. So now, now let's consider all the other test functions. So we started with uh, considering only the test functions in x0. So now, next, 
consider all leftover test functions v in x set minus is what that symbol means x zero so these are all the functions uh, in x that are not in x zero so what is that and uh, that is the functions v in x such that b q comma v is not equal to zero uh, for all uh, functions q yeah so that, those are all the remaining test functions and let's again take a look at that uh, that statement now but now we have already defined a function u, a function u that solves this equation. So I'll use that function as data, as a known solution. Uh, so I'll put that on the right hand side and I'll only look for a solution p. So then this equation becomes find p in y such that b p comma v is equal to l of v minus a of u v which is again a given uh, uh, u is given at this point which makes this just a linear form for all functions v in and the way that we typically write this is um, we call this x uh, transpose now so this is going to be x transpose because it's sort of or maybe x tangential I don't know it's sort of tangential to all the all the functions in x x zero. So what are the conditions that we have in order for this to produce a, one, a unique solution P? Well, the problem that we're dealing with now is, is not so nice, right? We have different uh, spaces. We have a space Y and a space XT, which means that we cannot rely on some sort of coercivity. Rather, for problems of this form, we discussed that we needed to in subconditions, both of them in principle. So in principle, we need both in subconditions for this to be true. What were those again? These were infimum supremum of B, P, uh, that was a Q, P, V divided by the norm of P in Y, V in X, larger than some constant alpha larger than zero and then I always forget which one comes first which one comes second uh, not, I, it's p in here p in y v in x there we go but not really x x transpose right in principle this should be x transpose i'll get back to that in just a second and the second one was uh, this this annoying zero condition that b uh, v uh, v sorry b uh, b p v is equal to zero for all p means that v is equal to zero or should use a big arrow here has as a, con uh, uh, a conclusion that this holds so let's first consider the the, the in sub condition here so that is the direct condition that we had from the previous video with the the, the relevant spaces y and xt um, now clearly if, uh, if, if the infimum of the functions in xt is, is larger than zero, then also uh, I'm allowed to search for a larger space for my functions v, because this is the worst case, right? If the worst case is going to be larger than, than, than a for 
uh, as all functions in XT. Then I can add more functions V, but the worst case is is not going to get uh, uh, is is not going to get uh, any 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 worse uh, because these are the best cases. Yeah. So the worst case of the best case, if I uh, permit more functions to search for the best case, then the worst case is not going to change. Again, talking about if subconditions uh, gets a little confusing. It's really something that. You just have to see often enough to get a feel for what's what's going on. Yeah? You got to start somewhere. Okay, so that's why uh, there was no XT in that second LBB condition. Right, we have two conditions. We have uh, the in sub uh, just simply in X. Technically, we could also write a condition like that. Oh, not like that. Not like that. Because again, as I said, that that's going to give me the same condition. But uh, just for uh, cleanliness of, of writing this, we typically simply consider x. Because it's giving you the same, the same condition and the, even the same expression for beta. So what's up with that second condition? Why does that not show? Well, that is to do with this space xt. Um, now I have to carefully think because I haven't thought about this in a year. Um, by definition of this space xt, that second condition always holds. If this condition is true for all solutions p, If this condition is true for all solution P, then this has to be zero. Automatically means that V is equal to zero. Mm, why was that true again? Yeah, so by definition of this space, by definition of this space, this guy is never going to be equal to zero. Um, I should maybe make one, one additional remark. So we're always dealing with vector spaces, which means that the zero function itself is always uh, in these spaces, both in x0, both in xt, and both in x. Um, so somehow we have to append to this zero function. No. Okay. So uh, a slightly new definition here. V is in the function space X, excluding all functions for which this bilinear form is not is is uh, is equal to zero except for the function v is equal to zero. The zero function always has to be in a space, uh, else, uh, uh, else it's not a vector space. Okay, so if this is saying this is going to be equal to zero for all functions p, well then clearly it's, in, it's not in this part of our space definition, so rather it has to be in the zero part, which means that uh, this condition or that, that v is automatically zero. Yeah? So thereby I'm saying that the second in subcondition is satisfied by definition of the space v. Why, why do I keep uh, x? By definition of the space xt in which we're searching for, the second condition is always satisfied, which means that the only leftover condition from the inf-sub condition was this, uh, this actual inf-sub statement. Yeah, so we only really require this one. And if this one then holds, then this equation gives one unique solution p. So that means that we now have one unique solution p and we have one unique solution u. Uh, which means that the original problem 
indeed permits a solution, a unique solution pair U and P, uh, and, and that's the definition of well posedness, that there is a unique solution uh, to the problem. So the first condition again was required for the first part of, 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 our, of our proof um, where we're obtaining a unique solution U, and the second part, uh, the second condition uh, was required to, to define a unique solution P. Okay, so uh, I hope that I, uh, I managed to, to explain this in, in, in reasonable clarity. Now let me actually emphasize that this is pretty uh, advanced, uh, advanced uh, stuff, uh, also in finite element theory. Uh, this is not uh, the typical uh, type of, uh, of, of, of mathematics or, or problems uh, that you uh, find in most introductory textbooks, right? This is more, more advanced stuff. Um, nevertheless, it's something that will actually be uh, quite important uh, for our analysis of the Stokes equation because, well, that's exactly an equation of, of this form, right? And whether or not we're really going to talk much about the subconditions, I'll, I'll actually um, decide when we get there. Uh, but I do want you to understand what the underlying uh, requirements for well posedness are. And I want you to get a feel for that these are actually difficult requirements. And, and that's why these Stokes equations are difficult to understand. And probably in the next uh, video, I'll actually talk about now uh, the, the discretization of these equations. Uh, and then we'll see that again, we have to rethink these conditions whether these conditions hold also for the discrete system of equations. And it is precisely uh, that that might not be the case is, is why we're so, um, the solution quality is so dependent on the choice of finite elements space, not only the space, but also the, the, the pair of spaces, the spaces for U and the spaces for, for P. And I think in order to get a, an appreciation for, for those problems, it's important that you have at least uh, looked at this. Um, whether you understand every detail, well, I, I encourage you to, to try, um, but, but if, if, if you hang somewhere, then, then don't get uh, discouraged, is I guess what I'm saying. Okay, then uh, thank you for your attention and, and see you in the next video.